Well, thanks to the workshop organizers for including me, and I guess I had a say in that. So anyway, it's good to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about the legal side, what, what is legal, um, where it's legal, and what may be on the horizon. And um, I'm going to talk about a couple things. How do the rules for physician-assisted death compare to withdrawal of treatment in the United States? And I'll talk a little bit about physician-assisted death in other countries. Um, and what can we learn from the differences in the rules? So uh, it may sound like I'm making an argument in favor one way or the other. I do have a modest uh, bias in favor of physician-assisted death. But my goal here is to explain what I think is going on with the legal rules, why they're changing in the way they've been changing over the past, since Oregon legalized aid and dying. And especially I'm going to focus on the question, is it about how we die? Is it you know, self-administration, physician administration, withdrawal of treatment? Is that what's driving it all? Or does it really matter why we want to die? The, is it about terminal illness and, and related factors? OK, so a little terms we've heard, physician-assisted death, the physicians prescribes the lethal dose of medication, the patient self-administers. That's what we have in the eight states and uh, seven states plus DC in the United States. It's all about self-administration. Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Canada all allow this as well. If you look at uh, physician infusion or euthanasia, then it narrows to the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Canada. The US drops out, Switzerland drops out. OK, then withdrawal of treatment discontinuing ventilators, dialysis, feeding tubes, any other health care necessary to sustain a patient's life. That's legal in every state. I said many countries. It's probably most countries, but I haven't done a, a world survey to say whether it's many or most. But it's much more widespread than aid and dying. OK, two kinds of legal rules I'm going to talk about. One is who's eligible for the death hastening practice. And then what process? You're eligible, you qualify, but then you have to go through a bunch of steps to exercise the right you have. So I'm going to talk about both of those. And at first glance, it seems that the rule suggests very different views about withdrawal and aid and dying, that eligibility rules and, and process rules seem to be very different. But I want to suggest that if you look, drill down more, that there are more similarities than differences uh, across the practices. OK, who's eligible? Withdrawal of treatment, at this point, very little restriction. If you're a competent patient, any treatment, doesn't matter what your prognosis or type of care, you can be terminally ill, or you can have 40 years of life expectancy. It doesn't have to be a ventilator. It can be antibiotics or blood transfusion. <laughs> Pretty open-ended right. Uh, if For incompetent patients, that generally seems to be true, but there are a few little exceptions. If you look at living will laws, they actually talk about, uh, and this is sort of the first edition of living will laws that date back to the early years of early living will laws. Uh, they talk about a terminal condition. Let's see if I can make this work. Um, how do I do that? Is it touch screen? How do I get that link? Just right here. Oh, no, I have to click the link. Okay. Well, anyway, there's a definition of terminal conditions not the same as in the physician-assisted death, the sixth month. It says, basically, you have an irreversible, uh, incurable and irreversible disease that will result in death within a short time without, with or without the administration of life-sustaining treatment. So if you're on dialysis, you will die within a short period of time if you take away the dialysis. And it's, it's a pretty actually pretty broad definition because it's without treatment you'll die in a short period. So anybody who's got a chronic disease, I mean insulin dependent diabetes in theory fits because without your insulin you're going to die within a short time and it's an incurable and irreversible disease. There are also pregnancy exclusions in these laws that about three quarters of states have. Um, okay, but otherwise these are these are only under living will laws. Outside of living will laws, we don't see eligibility limits. But aid and dying, there are significant limits. In the United States, you, gotta, you must be terminally ill. Six months or less, that's in the statutory states. Montana, the one that did it by 
court decision doesn't give us much detail, but when they talk about terminal illness, they refer to the state's living will law, which has that definition of terminal condition that I said about die within a short period of time without life-sustaining treatment. So that seems to be the Montana rule. Have to possess decision-making capacity, have to be able to perform the life-shortening act, and you must be a resident of the state. Okay, so these are all the eligibility requirements that limit who's eligible for PAD in the United States. What about the process? You're an eligible person. What do you have to do? For withdrawal of treatment, we don't have a lot of discussion of this, but there are some courts that have said we want independent confirmation by two independent physicians that you really you know, have the prognosis that your doctor thinks you have, that you have capacity. But there's not a lot of uh, cases because in a lot of the famous cases like the Bouvier case, it wasn't, nobody contested the patient's capacity, nobody contested what their prognosis was, so the court didn't feel it had to get into that question. For incompetent patient, now we see a lot of important variation. It really matters which state you're in, and it really can depend on prognosis. If you're in D.C., Virginia, Indiana, Nevada, doesn't matter. You're, uh, well, I'm, let me start. If uh, the, every state says if you can show clear and convincing evidence of what the patient would have wanted, that, that guides us. They did a living will, they talked to their family. Clear and convincing evidence. If, if, if you can demonstrate this is what the patient would have wanted, every state does that. The question is what happens if we don't have clear and convincing evidence? They didn't do a living will. They didn't talk to their family members. And here's where it really varies. So in a lot of states, they'll tur we'll turn, the, the law says turn to the family. And that's DC, Virginia, Indiana, Nevada. A fair number of states will do that. But other states say, and this is uh, interesting, it depends on the patient's prognosis. It starts to look more like aid in dying. And the, and the big divide is for patients who aren't terminal, can live for a number of years, they're not permanently unconscious, they might have serious neurologic injury from an automobile accident, but maybe they're at the intellectual capacity of one or two year olds, and I picked that because that's based on real cases then they can be very strict. And if we don't have clear and convincing evidence, those states might say, uh, we're gonna err on the side of life and you gotta treat. So the Wendland case in California is a good example, the Martin case in Michigan, uh, Conroy case in New Jersey. There's uh, half a dozen states, Wisconsin's another one, um, that, that follow this rule. Okay, physician-assisted death. Lots, um, so what do you have to do? We've, uh, as Linda mentioned, you have to have independent physician confirmation of diagnosis, prognosis, patient's capacity, and that it's a genuine consent. <coughs> this is really what they want, that they're not impaired judgment. It's only one physician. Notice I mentioned here for the competent patient with withdrawal, some New Jersey and uh, Nevada is at two physicians. Uh, the possibility of the cycle, right, if, they, if there's a sense that their judgment is being impaired, then you refer them for a psychological or psychiatric evaluation, multiple disclosure requirements. It kind of looks like some of the abortion laws, all the things you have to tell the patient, um, what the alternatives are that, um, you know, that advise them that notify, you know, that it might be useful to notify their family. But there's like a dozen specific disclosures that you have to make for the patient. And then two oral and one written request over a 15 day period. Okay, so these are, so you've got to go through a number of steps, and we'll hear more about the, the advisability of them later. Okay, why the differences in the rules? Okay, and this gets back to the how and why. Is it because there are meaningful moral differences between passive and active practices, that withdrawal is less troublesome as a moral matter than prescribing drugs or infusing drugs? Is that what's going on? That's one view. Um, you've heard that, I'm not gonna spend time on that because you're familiar with it, and, and, and so I'm gonna spend time on another thing because I'm a, speaking as a law professor today, I'm also a physician, but I'm gonna speak from my law professor side. And is this about operationalizing the moral principles? How do you turn moral principles into legal rules? Because sometimes it's not so clear, it's not such a straightforward thing. So that's what I'm gonna suggest Here's an alternative explanation. It's the one I believe in. Maybe you do or not, but hopefully I'll persuade you that this is, or that's worth thinking about. Okay, or maybe there's an element of both. Okay, so here's, let's talk about the operationalizing moral principle. I'm, I think this is, 
an important premise. I think what drives end-of-life law is the desire to allow relief of suffering from serious and irreversible disease. Why do I think that? Because when I read court decisions and I read articles in the liter medical and legal literature on why, the normative arguments that are made, when I read the uh, statement by religious organizations about why it's OK to refuse life-sustaining treatment, it's all about suffering in the setting of serious and irreversible disease. So uh, there may be some false consciousness out there, but this is what people talk about. OK. So the question is, if we believe that people who are suffering from serious and irreversible disease ought to be able to get relief, and even sometimes choose a quicker death, that sometimes quality of life is more important than length of life, if we believe that that should allow the choice of a quicker death, how do we allow that? How do we turn that into law? Well, we could say simply, if you're suffering from serious and greatly, if you're suffering from serious and irreversible illness, you can choose a quicker death. Just, that's all we want to know. And that's what the Netherlands and Belgium do for physician-assisted death. You go to your doctor and you say, I'm suffering from serious and irreversible illness. They confirm your diagnosis. And if you're competent, they allow it. Um, so in that view, it doesn't matter how you die, whether you're withdrawing treatment, taking pills, having drugs infused. It's why you want to die. I want to die because I'm suffering from serious and irreversible disease. That would be just the straightforward translation of the moral principle that I think is driving all this. Um, OK, so here's, let me give the um, all, so we don't do that here. So here, why don't we do that here? OK, so if you go back to the 1960s and 70s when people disagreed, can, is it OK to withdraw life sustained treatment? Is it killing somebody to turn off a ventilator? Remember in those days it was called passive euthanasia, back to Daniel's question about terminology, it wasn't called withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment, it was called passive euthanasia, which was kind of a pejorative term, became accepted, and now we call it withdrawal of treatment. Okay, the Quinlan Court, seminal case, 1976. It didn't say what we, uh, today, you're competent, you're, you can refuse treatment, said if you have a dim prognosis, that was their term, the court used dim prognosis, that's who could have treatment withdrawal, patients with a dim prognosis, in other words, patients suffering, as they explain it more, patients suffering from serious and irreversible disease. They did with you know, just a direct translation. That was the key moral principle. So if you look at the right to refuse treatment in the United States in 1976 under Quinnan, looked much like the right to PAD today, right? Terminal illness today and PAD, serious and irreversible illness in 1976. Well, that, didn't, that lasted a few years. But here's the problem, and this is the operationalizing thing. If patients can have treatment withdrawn only when they're seriously enough ill, then you have to have the government or doctors on their behalf have to decide who must live and who may die based on judgment about patients' quality of life. Right? You show up to your doctor and say, look, I've got metastatic cancer. I'm going to die in a few months. I want you know, to, a prescription for pills, or I want you to stop my uh, chemotherapy, and the doctor would have to you know, talk to you, review your records, and say one of two things. You're right, your life is miserable, you can die, or no, you have a lot to live for, we're going to keep you alive. And that's the kind of thing I don't think we want the gov that kind of decision making for the government to make. So, so what do we do? So the courts abandon this Qu Quinlan standard. You don't have to have a dim prognosis. Any patient can refuse treatment. And it's up to the patient. As the court's later court said, those considerations of the quality of life and length of life, that's for the patient to weigh, not for the state to weigh. But that's OK in terms of the, our moral principle that you can choose a hasten death when you're seriously and irreversible Ill, Ill because the typical withdrawal case actually involved who, you know, what, what are the cases when somebody's coming to court asking to with, turn off a ventilator, feeding to dialysis, people who are suffering from serious and irreversible illness. We don't have to worry when we, when we let the patient decide that we're going to open the door to all these people who aren't seriously and irreversible ill, Ill asking to stop treatment. And the other refusals that don't fit this model are based on religious belief. The Jehovah's Witness doesn't want a blood transfusion. The Christian scientist doesn't want antibiotics. And I will say these refusals aren't always respected. A fair number of court cases. 
where they had to go to court over this. Okay, so, so what I'm saying then is I do think the distinction, I think the law says the distinction between treatment withdrawal and PAD is an important moral distinction. I do think it is, but not for the usual, not for the usual reasons given. In other words, I don't think this is like abortion under Roe versus Wade or same-sex marriage today where there's been a shift in people's views about abortion or shift in people's views about same-sex marriage. I think our views have stayed the same that we think people can choose death when they're suffering from serious and irreversible illness. What's changed is how we turn that into that moral principle into legal rules. So this distinction between treatment withdrawal and aid in dying has historically provided a useful legal proxy. We've used it to sort the morally justified death from the morally unjustified death. Because as I said, we can't just do it on a case by case, direct basis. We do this a lot, speed limits, voting ages, right? Speed limit, we could, what's the moral principle? You should drive at a safe speed. And in fact, Montana and I would try that. They did say that. You can drive at any speed that's safe. Well, that gets to be problematic because different police officers have different views about what's safe, and different drivers have different views. So they got rid of it. There was a guy in Montana who drove like 150 miles an hour. It was a Pyrrhic victory. He got the ticket thrown out, but he also lost his ability to drive at any safe speed. Um, voting age is the same thing. We say you get to vote at 18. I mean, the moral principle is when you're, on, you know, whatever makes you, you know, qualifications for voting. But you can imagine the problem if we said you had to go down to the voting registrar and prove that you're ready to vote. Um, you know, a Republican registrar would have different criteria than a Democratic registrar. Okay, so we just don't get into these case-by-case -case judgments in a number of areas because they raise too many problems. And we just look for, you know, rough and ready rules that, that do a good job of sorting. And I think that's what's gone on with end-of-life laws. Um, but legal, when you do this kind of general approximations, they're, not, they're imperfect by definition, and so they need refinement. So I think what's going on with the change in Oregon and the states that we're up to, and as Linda said, we're about 20% of the population we're covering now, death with dignity laws reflect the view that the distinction between treatment withdrawal and aid in dying doesn't do a good enough job sorting between the morally justified and morally unjustified deaths. Because the argument in favor of aid in dying has been. But there are people who are suffering too who aren't dependent on a life-sustained treatment. What about them? Well, if you just open it up and say, okay, fine, anybody can have aid in dying, then you don't need to be suffering from serious and irreversible illness to want aid in dying. Terminal illness gives us that way of making sure if we open up aid in dying, we only do it for seriously and irreversibly ill, right? Oregon and those states don't say you have to show that you're really suffering. All you have to show is that you're terminally ill, unlike the Netherlands. We're not going to get into those case-by-case -case judgments. Just we want to make sure you're terminally ill. That's all we want to do. Okay, significance for the future. I think that what this suggests is that the terminal illness requirement really is a critical one. I don't think it's a coincidence that every state employs it because of its sorting role. Um, and the controversial cases, final exit network in the United States, Kevorkian's cases, cases you hear are coming out of Belgium and Netherlands, are cases of people who, who were not terminally ill. Those are the controversial cases. Also suggests that if you're going to expand the right to aid in dying beyond terminally ill patients, it's going to require some other kind of proxy that avoids case-by-case -case quality of life judgments. Um, I'll give you an alternative theory. There's another way to look at all of this, saying um, maybe you should be able to choose death hastening action. It's just personal autonomy. It's your choice. It's your body. You should be able to choose. You actually get to the same, same result because it's difficult to determine whether choice of death is a genuine expression of autonomy. Are they really competent? There are a lot of false positives in judging people's competence. So if you limit PAD to the terminally ill patient, you reduce the risk of cases where a person's really depressed, influencing their judgment. We miss that. We don't think it's influencing their judgment. And we let them go forward because we wrongly conclude they're making a general expression of autonomy. OK, what else can we expect if empirical evidence continues to be reassuring? I think we'll see more states. 
And then on the constitutional right, uh, I'll wrap up here. The Cruzan case came to the Supreme Court 14 years after Quinlan. That's when the Supreme Court waited 14 years, lots of experience in lots of states, whereas Glucksburg and Quill came to the Supreme Court before there was any experience with PAD. They were, at, they were asking the state, and my apologies to Tim Quill, they were asking the, 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 US, uh, the Supreme Court to recognize a right where there was no experience in the United States. I think that was asking a lot of the Supreme Court. Now we've got 20 years of data. As more states come on board, I think it'll look very different to the Supreme Court. So I'm out of time, and I'll look forward to your questions. And thanks again for including me.